السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Dear viewers everywhere welcome to a new edition of Askoda Our contact information beginning with the phone numbers Here code is 0020238552482 and the email address is ask at huda.tv our facebook page we will also collect questions on the facebook page is www.facebook.com forward slash msalah official barakallahu feekum without any further ado i will be more than happy to start taking your questions inshallah what did you have brother abu bakr from nigeria assalamu alaikum welcome to the program how are you brother abu bakr Wa alaikum salam, Shaykh. Wa alaikum salam, I hear you. I've been for a very long time. Barakallah fi, jazakallah khayran. Proceed on with your question, please. Yeah, so uh, my question is, uh, for, uh, in making supplication in sujood, it was stated that it is the best way for, uh, for a servant to be near to God is when you are in sujood. Yeah, in your sujood and supplication. What about it? So I want to know if I am able to make uh, dua on my native language to care for any something in, of dunya or an akhirah in my native language. In the sujood, dua is allowed. Okay. Okay. Any other questions about Bakr? Thank you. Jazakallahu khairan. Barakallahu feekum. <coughs> In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, وَأَمَّا السُّجُودِ فَأَكْثِرُوا فِيهِ مِنَ الدُّعَاءِ فَقَامِنٌ أَنْ يُسْتَجَابَ لِأَحَدِكُمْ Which means increase making dua, supplication in the state of sujood while you are prostrating yourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is more worthy for the dua which has been asked or invoked in sujood to be answered. And accept it. So every person should do dua, make supplication in their sujood. If he doesn't know how to make dua in Arabic, then it is permissible to do dua in their native language, in their mother tongue. I normally say there is a very comprehensive dua, which anything that you have in mind, it will cover it. The ayah. In Surah Al-Baqarah, the dua is prescribed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is the dua which he likes to be invoked with, which he will deliver an answer to. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Our Lord, give us a goodly reward in this life and a goodly reward in the hereafter and protect us again is the fire of hell. The goodly reward of this life covers everything. The wife, the children, the business, the school, the house, the money, the health, the wealth. And the goodly reward of the hereafter, it is pertaining to Al-Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst its dwellers. So I recommend that we should learn some of these supplications from the Quran and keep them in mind. And we frequently invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using these supplications. But otherwise, if you have a specific need that you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concerning in your mother tongue, you're absolutely free to do so, even in the sujood, whether in fard or nafl prayer. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Musa from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. May God have mercy on all of you. جزاك الله خيرا and you too. May Allah bless you and your family. I 
have a question. Naam. Uh, I miss Waraka from that door in Masjid. Okay. Uh, after the Imam uh, made salam alaykum, rahmatullah wa barakatuh, and uh, hello. I'm, I'm listening, yes, Brother uh, Musa, continue please. Okay, I got your question. Uh, this is pertaining to Al Masbuq of Salah, a person who entered the masjid and he found the Imam has started his prayer already. So, Brother Musa said that he missed one rak'ah. So, I expect his question will be how to go about it, how to continue my prayer. In the hadith, the Prophet said, فَمَا أَدْرَكْتُمْ فَصَلُّوا وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَأَتِمُّوا This is a segment of a lengthy hadith pertaining what to do when you enter the masjid and the imam is late. He said, do not rush, rather walk with tranquility and whichever position you find the imam in, join in, in ruku'ah, in sujood, in tashahud, just join in. And whatever you join in with the imam, is your first part of the prayer. How did we figure this out? Because he said, وَمَا فَمَا أَدْرَكْتُمْ فَصَلُّوا He didn't say, this is your first rak'ah. But it is understood from the hadith when he said, وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَأَتِمُوا This is a narration of Imam al-Bukhari, may Allah have mercy on him. And whatever you missed, continue. Complete. He did not say, make it up. If he said, make it up, as in a weak narration, which is faqdu, then I would consider whatever I miss with the imam, my first rak'ah, which I have to make it up. But now, since he said, fa'atimu, complete. So I begin my prayer with the imam in whichever position, and that counts for me as my very first rak'ah. So whatever you normally do when you pray, in the same order, first rak'ah you recite Surah Al-Fatiha, then it is a sunnah to recite a surah or a few ayat. Then in the middle, tashahud you recite only up to wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. You treat it as this is your first rak'ah, regardless which rak'ah is it whenever the imam is praying, whether it's his second, third, or fourth. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Ridwana from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Regarding uh, black uh, color for uh, hair. Okay. Uh, is it allowed for the um, men especially? It is not allowed for men nor for women to use the black color in dyeing the hair. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, غيروا هذا الشيب وجنبوه السواد. Change the color of the gray hair into other colors using dye, henna, whatever. But avoid the black hair, the black color. This is what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. So it's not permissible to use the black color in dyeing the hair, neither for men nor for women. بارك الله فيك سستر دوانا. سستر أم عبد الرحمن from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I had called in the previous episode. I believe uh, my question was not very clear regarding the second marriage. Okay, uh, after clarify a man your has question. Married, yeah, after a man has married for the second time, his first wife with two children is uh, reluctant to stay with him. And also she doesn't want to have a divorce also. Instead, she wants a financial security in the form of wealth and property for her children. Um, the thing is she just wants her husband to hang like she doesn't want to clear the situation for him. Neither she wants a kula nor a, nor a diver, but she wants a uh, good property because she knows that her father-in-law is a wealthy man. So in this case, what is the Sharia ruling on this? What sister, is the husband supposed to do? Sister Umm Abdurrahman, what she wants, basically I understood the same from you last time. What she wants is a state of confusion. There is nothing called that she doesn't want to live with him. Meanwhile, she doesn't want to divorce. Because if she's a wife, she must enable the husband to live with her as a husband and wife. She has rights 
and she owes duties. And he has rights and he owes duties. He's supposed to spend, to support financially, to support morally, because this is his wife. But if she for innocence says, no, I don't want to share bed with you. Rather, find me an independent housing and you just support me financially. There is no such thing. Okay, and nafaqa will be due or financial support will be due whenever the wife is living with the husband as a wife. But the state of neither married nor divorced doesn't count. That's called nushuz, disobedience. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept that. So what I'm saying now, if the person happened to marry before giving this wife any extra share of his wealth, now he has to be fair while dealing with the two wives. Before he's gotten married, if he decided to write his entire wealth to his first wife and to his children, he's free to do that. And this is fair and this is legal. But now with the second wife, he has to treat them both fairly. He can give the children, no problem, because the second one does not have any children yet. Okay? But... I don't think it is smart nor is it nice for the wife to put pressure on the husband and say, you have to secure my future financially. Meanwhile, I do not recognize you as a husband. I do want a divorce, but I'm not married to you. That doesn't make any sense. Again, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed or allowed plural, plural marriage, with conditions, of course, as we discussed repeatedly, and also we discussed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala limited the number of the women who may be taken in marriage at once to four, limited to four. He is the all wise and he knows best. So whenever this happens, everybody should yield and should be pleased with Allah's decision. I know it is hard, but at least you should accept it. If you want a divorce and you believe that you cannot live with this man anymore, you dislike him or whatever, you can ask for it. But you would only get your legitimate financial rights, not any extra. Barakallahu feek, sister Umm Abdul Rahman. Barakallahu feek. Brother Muhammad from Oman. Muhammad, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salatul Tasbiyah is a bida or a highly meritorious act. To do what? Tasbih on the beads? Muhammad, mute your TV please. Yeah, Salatul Tasbiyah. Salatul Tasbiyah. Naam. Salatul Tasbiyah. Okay. Jazakallahu khayr. Thank you, Brother Muhammad from Oman. Brother Abu Muhammad from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum wa shaykh. Good evening. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening to you. I'm fine. Alhamdulillah. Go ahead. Yes, I have one question regarding Aswaq. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لو لا أن أشوف على أمتي لا أمركهم لسواك ما كل يدو. Now, I want to know, is it true that some people say that the prayer performed after Aswaq has more sawaq than you want to perform without siwak, if I like you to explain a little bit on the benefits of siwak. Okay. okay. Abu Muhammad's question is pertaining a sound hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, لَوْلَا أَنْ أَشُقَّ عَلَىٰ أُمَّتِي لَأَمَرْتُهُمْ بِالسِّوَاكِ مَعَ كُلِّ صَلَاةِ Or, قَبْلَ كُلِّ صَلَاةِ Before every prayer, I would have ordered my ummah to use the miswak, to brush their teeth with the miswak or the brush. If, if I was not afraid, it would be very hard uh, for them to do so. So he said some people believe that the prayer with the miswak will, be, uh, will have a greater reward. Definitely, using the miswak has a great reward. And a person using the miswak, whenever it is prescribed, will be rewarded with the reward and disregard. But not only the miswak will determine the prayer would have a, a greater reward or not. Maybe a person used the miswak and he was not attentive or he did not do a proper tahara. So al miswak is a sunnah, not a wajib. The sunnah, not a wajib. It is highly recommended. If you use it, it would add up to the reward of the salah. Because the reward for offering the prayer is not limited to the prayer itself. 
It is how you perform tahara, how did you recite the dua at the top making wudu and after the wudu, whether you attended the prayer in jama'ah or not, dressed up properly and covered the awra or not, uh, and the amount of khushu' in the salah, it's many factors all together. Somebody who walked further away from the masjid to the masjid will have a greater word than a person who is next door to the masjid, as we discussed before. But the hadith encourages us to use a miswak very often, especially before uh, offering the prayer. Brother Muhammad from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad. Alaikum salam. Good evening, Sheikh. Good evening, Brother Muhammad. Go ahead. I have one question, sir. Okay. Last time you mentioned that uh, if a person prays Salat al Fajr and still where he is for the sunset, and when he pray to Raqqa, he will get the reward of Hajj and Umrah. Okay. So I just want to know, uh, like, what of if I will move from the mosque to my house, then I will continue the supplication and wait for the sunrise, then I will pray the two rakat. Got your question, Brother Muhammad. Thank you so much. Barakallahu feek. Okay. Uh, Brother Muhammad, who called earlier for Mu'man pertaining to Salat al-Tasabih, one single hadith narrated by Al-Abbas, the Prophet's uncle, may Allah be pleased with him, when he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya Abbas, ala ahbuk, ala ala, shouldn't I favor you, shouldn't I give you a, a, a great advice, a great reward, then he uh, prescribed for him Salat al-Tasabih with a certain setup to make 15 tasbih after the recitation of uh, the surah, then in the ruku, how many times, and upper rising from the ruku, many times. Uh, the hadith is judged as a weak hadith. Okay, Some of the scholars even do not recognize the hadith. And this is where the difference of opinion lies in, because of whether the reference is sound or not. And uh, many of the scholars are of the view that uh, we cannot initiate ibadah based on a weak hadith or a weak reference. Some of our predecessors have said even if you pray it once in your lifetime, it is recommended. I like normally to come out of this confusion and difference of opinion by simply sticking to other acts of worship which are confirmed. Aisha radiallahu anha narrated how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to pray the night prayer. And uh, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman likewise. The hadith which Brother Muhammad just asked about the last uh, question from Nigeria pertaining Salat al-Duha. Uh, other hadith pertaining the importance of Duha in which altogether. The nawafil before and after the prayers. So there are many emphatic sunan. Stick to these sunan and practice them, and come out of this confusion. Because the scholars said it was only narrated by one companion with a very unique setup of how to pray it. So how come that no other companion was aware of it? Okay. Still, if you prayed it, take in the opinion of some of the scholars because they said it's recommended to pray it, to pray it. may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. But I give you my preference. Wallahu a'lam. Uh, Sister Ummu Zakaria, Assalamu Alaikum, welcome to Ask Wada. Alaikum Salam, Sheikh. Go ahead, Sister. Yeah, Sheikh, my, um, my mom died when I was very young, so her sister took us in, me and my sister. Yeah. She had two kids, a girl and a boy who were older than us. So we didn't know that our mom died, so she, we actually knew after last year. Mm. And she breastfed my big sister, but she said her breasts were dry, so she didn't give her milk. But what I want to know, my question is, the boy, we, we knew him as a brother. So now that I know he's my cousin, can I shake hands with him or can I walk without my head cap? Okay, barakallah, thank you so much. Zakilah, a very interesting question. Maybe I would like to repeat the question for some of the viewers who didn't get the question. The sister said that her mother passed away when she was very young and uh, her aunt looked after them. She took over. They didn't even recognize that 
she was not their mother. They always treated her as their mother. They were very young. They didn't know neither her nor her sister. She also didn't breastfeed them. Okay, so she treated her cousin, her maternal cousin. She treated him as a brother because this is what they thought. Now, can she still treat him as a brother, not as a cousin? In a sense, of course, in Islam. It makes a difference because a brother is a mahram, permanent mahram. A woman can take the hijab off before her brother. She can travel with him. She can sit alone with him. He's a brother. But this person is not your brother. He's a cousin. So taking off the hijab before him is not allowed. Even though you were raised together. You were brought up together. And uh, your aunt should have told you from the beginning that she is your aunt, not the mother. But anyway... It's been a while, and alhamdulillah, shukla, she tried to correct that. If she remembers that she happened to breastfeed you, okay, at least five times, then this cousin of yours has become a brother due to breastfeeding or suckling. Will be treated exactly when it comes to the mahramiya relationship like your own brother, okay? Marriage does not become permissible anymore. But if she didn't get to breastfeed you, five times, five separate times at least, then this person is not a mahram to you. So you cannot shake hands with him. And no, could you sit before him without wearing the hijab? Barakallah fiq. Sister Nadia from the KSA. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to ask with sister Nadia. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, I guess we lost that call. Please try again. Brother Muhammad from Nigeria asked about a hadith which I mentioned a few times. The hadith pertaining the virtues of praying Fajr in congregation, then sitting to make adhkar in the same place of the prayer until it is sunrise. Then a few minutes past sunrise, you pray two rak'ahs. These rak'ahs are known as Salatul Duha or the full noon. Its time is past sunrise and until uh, before the sun moves away from its median, 20 minutes before Zuhr time. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does so will receive the reward of performing Hajj and Umrah, complete Hajj and Umrah. So he says, would that count the same if I pray Fajr, then I walk home and I say my Azkar until I reach home. No, you will be rewarded, but not the same reward. Because when we examine the text, it says, Fi majlisi ladi salla fi, where you have offered the Fajr prayer. Because this privilege and this great reward for staying in the masjid after the prayer and making the adhkar in the masjid, for long staying in the masjid. So you will be rewarded definitely for a zikr, for walking back and forth to the masjid, okay? Uh, and for praying duha, there is a great reward for praying duha even if you are not sitting in the masjid. But it is not the same reward as it has been mentioned in the hadith which I discussed earlier. Sister Jihan, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. I would like to ask you, please, if uh, excision uh, is obligatory in Islam. Uh, if? I'm sorry, what's obligatory? Uh, excision, uh, you know, circumcision for women. Circumcision. obligatory in Islam. Circumcision, right? Okay, you're talking about circumcision. Yes, circumcision for, for women. Yeah, For boys, yes, it is obligatory, and it counts as from the traditions of the pure nature. And to the extent that the Prophet ﷺ informed us about Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, who was circumcised, uh, circumcised at a very late age because it is the traditions of the pure nature. As far as for girls, there is a variety of opinions and different of opinions in this regard. Okay, between uh, it, it, they should be treated like the boys and between it is mere permissible, not a must. Barakallahu fiki. Now, brother, uh, 
Uh, sister Ravina. Ravina says, every time I try to stop committing a sin, like listening to music, people always tell me, you don't even wear hijab. So do you, uh, so you mind mm, as well keep singing or listening to music? Also recently, I did not attend a birthday party because I believe it was wrong. And they told me that you watch TV and you do not wear hijab, you wear tight jeans, uh, but you, attend, you do not attend birthday parties. Of course, this is the influence, the bad influence of the peer and uh, the bad influence of the bad company. The bad company could be uh, the household themselves. We're supposed to encourage people to repent. We're supposed to encourage people to quit other sins, not pick on them that how could you stop drinking while you're not wearing hijab? How could you stop drinking while you still date? Number one, we also discussed a tawbah from a particular sin. Would that affect other sins? Or if the person was involved in other sins, would that affect his tawbah from another sin or not? And the more right view, it would not. If somebody quit smoking, somebody quit smoking, but he still shaves his beard, would the sin of smoking not be forgiven even though he quit and he repented because he shaves his beard? No, that's a different sin. We hope and pray that this person would quit both smoking and shaving his beard will stop saving his beard because this is what the Prophet ﷺ ordered. Uh, a woman who does not wear hijab, meanwhile she quit listening to music and songs and dancing and alhamdulillah repented from that. And instead of saying that, how come you quit this and you still do that, rather ask the person to also quit from uh, this sin. وَدْعُوا إِلَى سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِظَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ This is a kind of da'wah. Not the other way around. There are dua ala abwabi jahannam, as the Prophet said. As there are callers who call people towards forgiveness and towards heaven, there are also callers on the doors and the entrance of hell. They invite people to come to enter an nar wal billah. By making it seem fair to them to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both uh, songs and music, haram, and as well as not wearing hijab or wearing Thai jeans before non-mahram and so on. So this is haram and this is haram. Not because a person is involved in one, he shouldn't repent from the other one. No, your tawbah from this is valid insha'Allah. And I encourage you to repent from both and to quit both and to recognize that the life is very short. And soon we will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Takathur, أَلْهَاكُمُ التَّكَاثُرُ حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ الْمَقَابِرُ The uh, competition in piling up wealth and worldly gains kept you busy and you will keep sucked in, in this business until you enter the grave. حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ الْمَقَابِرُ One has to realize this before it is too late. Also involving oneself in sinning without repentance, one has to realize that you can expire at any say time. Imagine yourself, you spend 15, 20 minutes, an hour, as, as I know that some, some girls do that before the mirror, wearing their nice makeup and perfume, makeup and mascara and whatever, and she made sure that she is like a beauty queen. And she stepped out. This woman has earned the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of so. This is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Okay. What if she dies? I'm not going to say got hit by a car or she slept and no, she just died because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted her to die naturally right this moment. What will be her condition? What will be your excuse before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I was planning to repent. I thought whenever I get 50 years old or 60, inshallah, I will start wearing hijab. <laughs> Think about an answer to this very important question. Think about what's going to happen next moment. If I die next moment, in what condition will I die? Husnul Khatimah, the good ending, is an ultimate goal. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Innamal a'malu bil khawatim. 
deeds are by their conclusion. So if somebody did a good deed and he died in this condition, this is a very pleasant thing because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a sign of salvation. But if the person was involved in a sin, particularly a major sin, somebody died while drinking. We see a lot of the commanders of the Syrian army, they die while drinking. They die while killing innocent people. Where would they go? Can any person say they're shuhada or they go to heaven? How? How could this happen? Somebody uh, died while he's committing adultery. And there are reports of people who died in this condition. What kind of guarantee that those people will be forgiven? Or This is a sign of a terrible end. So we have to be prepared for this moment. We're going to take a short break. Please stay tuned. Life is a journey, beginning with a single step. The direction is clear. But it still needs guidance. Huda GPS. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. We have some callers on the line. Sister Nadia from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Nadia. Okay, I guess this is the second time we failed to connect. Okay, Sister Asia from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, thank you for asking, Sister Asiya. Jazakallah khair. I have that? one uh, question. Uh, uh, as professional education has become costly, middle class families find it difficult in India to educate their children. Mm. So, Muslims in India have set up a charitable organization or NGO to finance as children. Mm -hmm. They have they have two schemes for students. Number one, scholarship non-refundable. Number two, interest-free loan refundable after getting job. Excellent. While while NGOs accept while NGOs accept zakat for first scheme, they do not accept zakat for loan scheme. My question is, are these schemes okay? And why not the zakat can uh, can be acceptable acceptable for the loan scheme? Jazakallah khair. Jazakum. Thank you. Uh, the setup that you mentioned is great. MashaAllah, la qata illa billah. And it is definitely sharia compliant. Alhamdulillah. And this is in compliance with the ayah of Surah Al-Ma'idah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى You should help one another to achieve righteousness and piety. So this is the kind of cooperation which is praiseworthy and admired by the Sharia. I would like to say once again, a free, complete scholarship for those who are eligible, non-refundable, or refundable, interest-free based loan whenever they graduate. That too is great. She also, Sister Asa mentioned that they do not accept the care in funding uh, such projects. And she said, why not? Because as zakah is the right of the poor, non-refundable. We cannot invest in the zakah. We cannot take the zakah, invest it somewhere to uh, give it back to the poor. 
as zakah is the right of the poor and once it is you it must be taken out and given to them without expecting any revenue out of that is not refundable that is the right of the poor once it is you they should they should collect it and dispense it in whichever way it suits them that's why such fun from the charitable the uh, sadaqah which is voluntary charity that is the only solution and I see this opportunity and I encourage the viewers who have an access to such fund if this fund is trustworthy to support them this is one of the very important means because education is very important I would like to see Muslims in India particularly highly educated if they cannot afford it we should support them to be educated so later on they support others and they support their deen Barakallahu feekum Sister Umm Abdullah from the KSA. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, I want to ask three questions. Naam. Uh, the first question is, after the Azan, how much time will it take uh, for the Fajr and the Maghrib prayer to be Kala? Okay. Okay, second question is, uh, can we cut our nails or hair during major impurity? During the period. Okay. The third is, uh, when we go home for vacation for one month, can we shorten our prayers for the first three days? Okay. Hello? Yeah, I got your questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sister. Uh, the first question is, okay, let's take a few more calls, inshallah, then I will answer this in order. Brother Fuad from United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Fuad, how are you? Alhamdulillah, brother, I'm fine. I just have one question. Uh, when I'm working in a bank, in a commercial bank here, and I just want to ask about that. In fact, in, uh, as per my knowledge, it is not uh, correct to work in a bank according to the economic rules and regulations. And um, you know the market situation here, all over the world, it is very difficult to find another job. So, what should I do? Shall I quit from the job immediately, or shall I wait for uh, a reasonable uh, job so I can quit from this job? What is your opinion there? Shall I wait for, or according to Quran, Utkhulu uh, Fisil Mikasa, that you just obey? And uh, I should quit from the job and then I can find another one. Tayyip. I just need your opinion about this one. Is that Allah Okay, 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 before I forget, uh, the sister who called last time about the credit card and the points, I guess we have some calls and inshallah I would uh, answer her question. Salam alaikum. Okay, that was cut off. She said the points that the credit card company gives me for using or, uh, or making some charges on the credit card. There are a couple of things. Number one, whether it is permissible to use a credit card or not. If the credit card is interest-based, even if there is a condition that you use the credit card and if you do not pay before a certain time, you have to pay interest, then this is a RIBA contract. We're done with this. When it becomes permissible for people who have to use it, like I can tell you, for instance, in, in, in America, for instance, uh, most likely you cannot live without using a credit card. Like for booking your flights, renting a car, buying things, you don't walk around with much of, of cash. But if there is a way that you can use a bank card or whatever, because sometimes they require a credit card. So if you can live without it, then there is no need for it because of the RIBA contract that involves uh, this transaction. Uh, if you have to use a credit card and you use it and you make sure that you pay before the due date and you do not pay any interest, they offer you grants, gifts, or points on your uses, this is halal. This you can use. The points you can use towards your flight, a free flight, a free car rental, a free dining somewhere. Okay? 
provided you're not doing this whole setup in order to enjoy the points. Rather, you're using this whenever it is necessary and you pay on time so that you do not pay interest on any late payment and it comes with the package so you can enjoy it. If there is a way that you can use a bank card, an ATM card instead of the credit card, tear it apart and live interest-free life. Barakallahu feek. Sister Hala from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I just want to ask about that. Uh, a while ago, you are talking about the salah at duha. It is also applicable for the women. We are, for example, we are uh, up after Pajar. Uh, we will wait up to that. Uh, up to that, uh, up to the sunrise after fifteen. It is also applicable for women. Okay, Barakallahu Feek. <coughs> Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Now, uh, <coughs> how many minutes after Adhan should we wait before being able to pray the Father prayer? Once the time has entered or you heard the Adhan, you can pray the Fard. The time which we allow to pray the Sunnah, because it's a Sunnah, so if the person skipped the sunnah and prayed like if you are a traveler and then or the time has entered and you prayed innocently without praying the sunnah, that is valid. But you allow time to pray the sunnah. The setup in some of the masajid, they say that the iqama will be in 15 minutes or 20 minutes in order to inform the local people for innocence that do not be late before this time because you're going to miss takbiratul ihra and the people from out of town or from not from the neighborhood who may start the sunnah prayer while there is only a few seconds left. So this is for notification, but it is not something from the sunnah to set a date or time. There is no designation for how many minutes should we wait before we offer the father prayer after the adhan. Clipping the nails, removing the hair while in the menses, is it okay? It is okay. It is okay to clip the knees, remove the hair while in the menses, while in a state of janaba, or while not having wudu. Inna al mu'mina la yanjus. Some people think you, know, you can do that because the, the hair or the nail which you remove in this condition will be impure. While the, the, this myth or this thought comes in clear contradiction with the hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Subhanallah, inna al-mu'mina la yanjus. The believer does not become impure. Even a woman during the state of menses, the, the impurity is in one part. It doesn't stop her from shaking hands, kissing her husband and living with him or cooking for the family like the Jews used to believe in that. No. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa used to eat from the same bite after Aisha radiallahu anha have taken a bite from the meat. Drink from the same spot after Aisha radiallahu anha drank from the same spot while in her menses. He used to sit his head in her lap and recite the Quran while she is in the menses and, in the, and the hadith is collected by Bukhari wa Muslim. Traveling for a vacation for a month, can we shorten our prayer for the first three days? Okay, this is another confusion where people think that if I stay beyond the designated time which allows me to shorten the prayer, which is four days uh, according to the vast majority of the, uh, the scholars, can we then if I'm planning to stay for a month, can I keep shortening my prayer for three days or the four days according to different views? No. Once you decided you're staying, you are in a state of iqama or residency for that many days, then you should pray on fall and pray regularly and also pray the nawafil uh, along with the fard prayer and attend the salah in the masjid and everything because you are like the muqim exactly. Our beloved brother who called from United Arab Emirates and he shared with us his uh, grievous situation. He owes for a commercial bank. He knows that it is haram. Uh, you know, my body shivers when somebody says 
he's working in a conventional bank or he's selling something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited because the whole life cycle becomes haram. The whole life cycle. You know if somebody is doing haram like uh, smoking or drinking or whatever, he's affected only in this part. But the haram of the earning, earning unlawfully, it incurs the wrath and the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that person. First of all, كل جسد النبت من سحت فالنار أولى به. The hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. I know that I don't want to make it more difficult on you or on the viewers. But we have to share these facts because that is the thing which will make you strong. And make the decision without any reluctance and say, well, it's not worth it. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to die in this condition and go to fire. I don't want my flesh to be barbecued in the fire of hell because of working in a conventional bank. I don't care whether this bank is in Mecca or anywhere. Haram is haram. In the sound hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ الرِّبَى آكِلَهُ وَمُؤْكِلَهُ وَكَاتِبَهُ وَشَاهِدَيْهُ لَعَن اللَّعَن is to be expelled from Allah's mercy. You know the hadith and you know what it means. There is no such baraka in one's wealth who is earning from riba. Whether he is collecting the interest or he is working in a bank to assist people uh, earn uh, with riba and so on. Brother, work right now. Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I warn you, after this program finishes and every brother in the same condition, go back to Surah Al-Talaq. Surah Al-Talaq. Read this ayah. وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ يُسْرًا مَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ If you fear Allah, if you obey Allah, and do not challenge him with the sin of riba, Allah will give you a way out of every hardship. Furthermore, a risk which you are challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in work in, uh, in haram for it. Your, uh, people are earning unlawfully because of the risk. What they worry about most is the risk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am a razzaq. I am the only one who provides. He is a sustainer. He is a samad. He is a razzaq. Inna Allah huwa razzaq dhul quwwatil mateen. So he says what? Wa yarzuquhu min haythu la yahtasim. He will provide for you and for everyone who will quit the haram for his sake. How? It's none of your business. That's his business. Don't you ever ask, how does Allah feed the fetus and the embryo? How does, how does this happen? That's his business. Your business is to eat, is to collect the provision. Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَن تَمُوتَ نَفْسٌ حَتَّى تَسْتَوْفِيَ رِزْقَهَا وَأَجَلَهَا you're not going to die out of hunger when you quit the haram. La wallahi. Allah will never disappoint his beloved ones. Rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a better replacement. You are falling in the pit. And you feel suppressed. And you feel this is a nightmare. You feel that like if you come out of this place you're going to die. No. That's not going to happen. Rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pick you up. Work hard. And uh, until then. If you don't have any fun to support you, if you don't have any other mean, I don't mind working as a janitor. But I will never work and earn unlawfully, insha'Allah Azza Jal. I don't mind selling vegetables and tomatoes in the street. But I will not sell anything that Allah has prohibited. I will not exchange or do any business which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have cursed and cursed those who deal with it. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وذروا ما بقي من الربا إن كنتم مؤمنين فإن لم تفعلوا فأذنوا بحرب من الله ورسوله Who can afford to be in a war with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you out of your mind? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you trust me I will provide for you from ways and means which you could never imagine But if you still insist I will destroy you This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Guide us to what's best. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.